This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number eight. Welcome to the eighth episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility related. Um, if you enjoy today's show, please join the conversation by stopping by the blog and leaving a comment in the show notes. You'll find the show notes for today's episode and all of the podcast episodes at fertilityfriday.com slash podcast. And you can also tweet me at Fertile Friday if you just wanted to stop by and say hello. And I'm so excited to welcome today's guest, Amy Sedgwick of the Red Tent Sisters. Amy has a unique background in traditional medicine and alternative health. She is a certified holistic reproductive health practitioner and a practitioner of the Arvigo techniques of Maya abdominal therapy. Amy has been teaching the fertility awareness method for many years now. And if you haven't heard of the Red Tent Sisters yet, you should definitely head over to their website, which of course we'll be linking to in the show notes. The Red Tent Sisters are a family-based business based out of Toronto, and they have been working tirelessly for many years now to provide holistic solutions for women in the areas of natural birth control, pregnancy preparation, fertility support, sexuality, and so many more. So I'm so pleased and excited to welcome Amy to the podcast. So welcome, Amy. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Oh, well, so, so happy to have you. So let's dive right in. I did give you a bit of an intro, but maybe you could tell the listeners maybe a bit about your background in reproductive health and sexual health, and also a bit about your amazing family business, the Red Tent Sisters. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so I was originally trained as an occupational therapist, and I knew during my training and, and afterwards that I was going to want to work kind of outside the box. I had always had a bit of an interest in um, sexual and reproductive health. I wasn't quite sure how my journey was going to land me there, but I just kind of had faith that eventually something would happen. And of course it did um, <laughs> in the way that these things do. Um, so basically, after I had my daughter, I ran into a lot of side effects with uh, hormonal birth control, which I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit later. And uh, it led me on this whole journey to discovering uh, the fertility awareness method, the Justice method in particular. And it really did change my life. And because of that, um, I took sort of a leap of faith and just decided I was going to dive right in and train to become a holistic reproductive health practitioner. Um, and I wanted to be able to teach this method to other women. I felt it was knowledge that every woman should have about her body, which I'm sure you can relate to. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And um, around the same time, my sister was graduating with a women's studies degree and trying to figure out what to do next in her life. And she really had a passion around um, teaching women about sexuality and helping improve their, their confidence um, level of satisfaction in terms of their sex lives. And so we just kind of started joking around about the idea of opening a business together. We've always been very close as sisters. We're more than sisters. We're really best friends. And um, so we love the idea of working together. And we thought that our interests really um, complemented each other. So we had the idea for our business, um, I guess, around you know, this time, kind of like late 2006. And we opened our doors in the summer of 2007. I think that's such an inspiring story and it's so mm -hmm. great that, that you get to work with your sister every day and yeah. <laughs> and also the amazing impact that you're making in women's lives because this is an area that obviously doesn't get talked about a lot but it's such it has such a big impact personally on everybody's life your fertility your sexuality your health um, absolutely so I yeah I love the work you you've been doing and I I have been following you and just kind of your blog and everything for many years Oh, thank you. Um, we love doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it shows. It totally shows in the work that you do. Um, and so you mentioned your own experience with the pill around the time when you had your daughter, and you mentioned some of the side effects that you experienced and kind of getting drawn into the more natural methods of birth control. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about what that was like, the kind of transitioning between um, yeah. Yeah, the hormonal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to expand on that story because I think it's um, a story that a lot of women can relate to in that, you know, I first went on hormonal birth control when I was about 16 and I wasn't yet sexually active, but I had really, really painful periods. Um, they were very irregular as well. 
Um, I would often be bleeding so heavily and with so much pain that I had to take two or three days out of school. Um, so it was, it was really unmanageable. And so my doctor put me on the pill and I was on it from the age of about 16 to 26. You know, and I'm kind of ashamed to admit now that I didn't really think of anything, anything of it at the time. I had no idea the impact that it was having on my body or that um, the fact that I was having all those menstrual problems in my teens was obviously a sign that, you know, I had some nutritional issues and some health issues that really should have got sorted out rather than suppressing those symptoms for a decade. Um, so anyway, I did come off the pill, um, you know, not because I figured out how bad it was, but because I, you know, got married and decided that we were ready to start a family. And uh, sure enough, all the simi- similar kinds of issues came back, intense menstrual pain, irregular cycles. Um, but I didn't really know anything about fertility at that time. And so, uh, you know, I was fortunate that I got pregnant. It was probably about a year after um, coming off the pill and starting to try to have a family. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, I think it's kind of a miracle that (laughs) I got pregnant after a year because at that time my cycles were pretty unhealthy. Um, anyway, after I had my daughter, both my midwife and my GP started asking me about, you know, what I was going to start using for birth control that now that, you know, I had this newborn and I had to start thinking about that again. And I told them that I was considering getting an IUD because I wanted something a little bit more permanent that I didn't have to think about so much. Uh, And my doctor told me that, you know, the commonly prescribed IUD is one that has synthetic progesterone in it. And, you know, I'm very grateful to her because she did say to me, you know, a lot of women, you know, have side effects, especially emotional side effects from taking, you know, a birth control method that's only progesterone. And it can make you really moody and weepy. So she suggested that I try a progesterone-only birth control pill first to see how I managed with that um, kind of dosaging of hormone. And she said if it was okay, then she would, you know, arrange to have the IUD inserted after a few months. So I'm really grateful she did that because what happened was actually two or three days after I started on that pill, my daughter started uh, screaming every time I tried to breastfeed her. Oh wow! It was very, very stressful. She was about three or four months old at this point. We had never had any problems with breastfeeding. She had latched within half an hour of birth. I'd always had lots of milk supply. And so I was quite confused. You know, it's strange for breastfeeding problems to show up at three or four month mark. So I went to some breastfeeding clinics and they honestly couldn't figure out what the problem was. It was very clear that she was latching properly and that I had milk supply. So they didn't really know what was going on. So then kind of out of desperation, I suddenly, the penny just dropped. I was kind of like, oh, I went on that pill a couple days ago. I wonder if that has anything to do with it. So I came off of it and sure enough, within about 48 hours, the issue had resolved. And so I discovered through my own research that um, synthetic progesterone, which is known as progestin, can increase a woman's milk supply. And so what was happening was my daughter was essentially choking while she was trying to breastfeed. So the milk was coming out so quickly that she couldn't swallow fast enough. So she would kind of latch, start, and then start (laughs) spluttering and screaming. And yeah, so that was what was happening. So I was all all of a sudden kind of catapulted into this situation of needing to explore non-hormonal methods of birth control. And fortunately, my sister had recently been out west. She had attended a workshop about the Justice method. And so she passed along the information about it to me, thinking it might be helpful for what I was going through. So I read through the Justice manual. And uh, I have to admit that even with a health sciences background, I was like totally like shocked about <laughs> all the things I learned about how my body was working. I was like, really? That's how that works? <laughs> You know, it's, I was just so naive when I look back on it. Um, so anyway, I tried to start charting um, based on what I learned from the manual. But because this was, this was all very foreign to me, and the, especially the idea of you know paying attention to my body in this level of detail, um, I kind of had to admit that I was just confused. <laughs> so I hired somebody. At the time, there were very few of us HRHPs, you know, um, trained by Justice. And so I worked with a woman named Megan from out west, and we did it all by distance. And I had sessions with her probably monthly for at least a year. Um, and then, you know, not quite as frequently, but continued on for another couple of years. And, you know, I continue to have my own sessions. And I was just shocked at how much I learned about my body. It very quickly went from being about birth control to being about 
wow, like look at all the things I'm learning about my body. I discovered a thyroid issue from my charting and I discovered food allergies through my charting and I discovered all sorts of nutritional deficiencies that have been contributing to my heavy um, periods. So it really became for me like my primary tool for monitoring my own health. Yeah, I can I can relate to your story and and I just, like you said before, you said it's such a common story that so many women can relate to. I love the way that you kind of took us through the whole path and even just how you thought that, like most women, you kind of just, we, I similarly uh, was put on the pill for menstrual uh, irregularities around that same age, 15, 16, and you don't really think anything about it. Why would you? You're 16. The doctor says it's okay. Everyone does it. So you don't really yeah, think anything of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I can relate to what, to your story. And I think that it's really interesting when you actually do start learning it because it's just, it's so foreign and you just, mm -hmm. no matter how much you learned in, in science class, I mean, it just, you just never actually get that information unless you're exposed to the fertility awareness method. Yeah, absolutely. And every woman that I work with to teach them this method says the same thing. Like, why don't we learn this in school? Why isn't this just a part of growing up? And I hope that one day it will be, that it's not going to be like that it has to take this like serious event to suddenly catapult us into a situation where we actually know how our bodies work. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it's this underground movement, you know, it's, and yeah. that's what it is because mm -hmm. it's just not mainstream. And yeah. since you've been working with women who are kind of in similar situations for many years, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the common effects that you've seen in your practice uh, when women are in similar situations coming off the pill, whether it's a few years of use or many years of use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I see in women coming off the pill really ranges dramatically, um, both in terms of, you know, the symptoms that we see, um, you know, in terms of the body adjusting, but also how long it takes to kind of get back to healthy cycling. Um, a few of the things that I've noticed seem to really have an impact on, you know, how quickly a woman recovers would be, you know, the age at which she was put on it. So a lot of women don't realize that, you know, from the time of our first period at menarche, um, it takes a good like two to four years for our reproductive hormones and our reproductive cycle to actually fully mature. And so if a young woman is put on the pill within a year of coming off, I've even had clients where they were put on the pill before they even got their first period. Um, then it's like their body has never fully undergone that maturation. So when they come off of it, it's almost like their body is going through a delayed maturation or there, there, there are pieces of the puzzle that are kind of missing. So that, t that tends to affect you know, how quickly a woman will return to, to regular cycling. Uh, another factor is how long she was on the pill. So there's usually a difference between a woman who only used it for a few months or even a couple of years and someone like myself who was on it for 10 years. Um, you know, there are some effects that I feel that I'm still experiencing now after 10 years of charting that are from the fact that I used the pill for 10 years during my, my youth. And, and I think that there's some damage there that may be irreparable. Um, you know, and there are things that I can certainly do to minimize the impact. And certainly that's the case for most of my clients. But, um, you know, when you've been on it a decade, there, there's a lot that it does. Um, so that's another factor. And then another huge factor that I've seen impacts women's recovery from the pill is really their nutritional status. So, you know, how, what their diet is like, how clean it is in terms of um, eating mainly whole foods, non-processed foods, um, and cutting out food allergens and just kind of the general health of the, the gut. So that's another big factor. And then, of course, there are other factors like, you know, genetic issues. You know, my mother had really horrible periods as well. And I know that that's partly just something that runs in my family. Um, and, and stress is another big one. So how women deal with their stress, what kinds of stress they're under, you know, that's a, another big impact because uh, stress hormones have a major effect on the reproductive cycle. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there um, because there's, like you said, there's just so many different factors that impact a woman's health when she's coming off of the pill. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things yeah. that I found, make a, I found made a really big difference for me was changes in diet. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how when women do find themselves maybe having, well, when they're coming off of the pill, just trying to reach that healthier, more robust menstrual cycle after years of kind of being on autopilot. What are some of mm -hmm. the things that you found to be helpful 
uh, diet wise, lifestyle, those types of things that can help to maybe just improve the, the process of getting that cycle into a healthy place. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few factors to consider. So one is that um, the hormonal birth control and the pill, they actually deplete our body of certain essential nutrients, micronutrients. So um, the B vitamins and folic acid, you know, for as just one example, but there are many. So um, taking supplements that are going to help your body to replenish um, those lost stores of nutrients is, is really important. Um, and unfortunately, it's just kind of the nature of our food these days that even if we're eating a really great diet, our, our food is just for the most part grown in less nutrient rich soil than it used to be, you know, depending on whether you shop organic and local, it might've been sprayed with all sorts of stuff, or it might've been picked before it was fully ripe. And so there's just reduced nutrient quality, quality overall in the food that we eat. So we, to some extent kind of have to take supplements on an ongoing basis anyway, but you need to take higher therapeutic dosages of, of some nutrients when coming off the pill in order to replenish um, what's been lost during those years while you're on it. So that's certainly one thing. Um, another thing is that you want to really clean up your digestive tract and your, um, your gut because if you're taking all these supplements but your gut is in really poor health, then your body won't even be fully absorbing those nutrients anyway. So some of the ways to do that, um, probiotics can be very helpful because a lot of women who are on the pill, the pill affects our natural balance of good and bad um, bacteria in the gut. And it also tends to do deplete our immune system and then when we're sick it's kind of like a cyclical thing we get sick and then we take antibiotics and that kills off even more of the good bacteria and so when we don't have um, the proper bacteria in our body it can also be very difficult to probably absorb our nutrients and to have a healthy gut um, so taking probiotics can be very helpful as well um, also eliminating any food allergies so food allergies can um, cause little micro tears in um, the digestive tract and lead to something called leaky gut syndrome. So that's basically where the, the lining of the intestines becomes so thin and so permeable that little pieces of food can actually end up passing through the lining and ending up in, you know, in the blood and in different parts of the body that where they don't belong. <laughs> you know, they need to be fully ingested and broken down into their proper parts. We don't want little pieces of food floating around in our system. So that can create an immune reaction because our body knows that those little bits of food don't belong outside of the digestive tract. And so then we're constantly taxing our immune system, which is another, another problem. So clearing out any food allergies so that you have a healthy gut, um, so that your you know, gut is not inflamed, you're properly absorbing your nutrients. Those are some of the things that you can do. And then, as I said, taking good quality supplements. Um, and then... In terms of lifestyle, I, I mentioned already about how stress is a major factor. So basically, when when your body gets stressed out or sick or you're traveling, it kind of says, okay, we're going to like shut down any non-essential functions because, you know, what, what's going on right now, it, like it's taking a lot of resources. And, you know, from a biological perspective, pregnancy is not only a non-essential function, but it's a very, it's like the most taxing one there is, right? Building a whole other body inside your body is, takes a lot of resources. So what happens is that when we're under those stressful conditions, your body delays ovulation or it cancels ovulation altogether because it knows that the body cannot handle getting pregnant. And so addressing stress is very important to optimal uh, reproductive functioning. And we all tend to be pretty stressed, I think, in the North American society anyway, or Western culture. It's just like nonstop bombardment with stuff. And we live in a lot of fear, I think. Um, and fear is a big stressor. And another thing that is a major stressor is our diets because um, we tend to eat very carbohydrate-dense diets. And when we eat a lot of carbohydrates all at once, it kind of spikes our blood sugar and then our body tries to whisk it away again. And then it's, we kind of have this yo-yo effect happening with our blood sugar and, and our, our stress hormones tend to get involved in kind of compensating for that yo-yo effect. And uh, so that can cause a lot of stress on what's called the adrenal glands. So, um, so those are some of the major stresses. So, uh, you know, if 
looking at how you're eating, how often you're eating, making sure your meals are balanced, making sure you're not eating too many carbohydrates, you know, relative to your fats and proteins is really important. Also, another one is making sure you're actually eating enough fat. You know, for decades, we lived in this like, you know, no fat culture where everything was low fat, no fat. And, and fat is actually essential for hormonal function. Our body builds um, sex hormones out of cholesterol. So if you're not getting enough of that in your diet, it's actually going to be really hard for your body to make estrogen and progesterone and all these you know, uh, hormones that are essential to reproductive functioning. So learning about good fats and making sure you're getting enough good fats in your diet is another really important one. And then... You know, because we're both from Toronto, <laughs> I also have to mention that in Canada, vitamin D deficiency is another huge problem. Um, so vitamin D is essential. Uh, it's it's We refer to it as a vitamin, but it's actually really like a proto-hormone. Like your body can synthesize it. It uses it like a hormone in your body. There's receptors all over the body for vitamin D. And so we actually need, um, a light-skinned person needs about 25 minutes of full body direct sunlight, like middle of the day sunlight, every day to get enough vitamin D. And someone with darker skin, it's like an hour and 20 minutes. So you can bet your booties that like nobody in Canada right now, (laughs) this time of year, is getting anywhere close to that amount of sunshine on their skin, right? Like we're all bundled up with our down jackets and we have like maybe our little cheeks showing. (laughs) So um, there's definitely like not enough vitamin D going on. So Um, taking a regular vitamin D supplement is really, really important, Um, especially like depending on where you live in the world, if there's not a lot of sunlight, that's a big issue. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This winter, I just found it ironic that everyone was really healthy and great and glowing. And then as soon as the sun went away, there, everyone gets the flu and, you know, we're all like, why did this happen? And (laughs) I think it's because the sun went away. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's so much amazing information that you provided there. There was something I wanted to go back to. You made a comment about how pregnancy, obviously, you're making another person. And I feel like, in a sense, I was really naive because it took me actually having a child (laughs) to really (laughs) consider that, you know, he came out of me. And so when I was eating like pizza, that was creating my baby. And (laughs) another thing uh, with the birth control pill is that research is showing that it depletes B vitamins and it disrupts Mm -hmm. your gut flora. Mm -hmm. Um, And you had mentioned that there's some impacts of the long-term pill use that are potentially permanent, even though you can do a lot to improve your health afterwards. So I guess I just wanted to maybe have you touch on, you know, if you're on the pill for a really long time and then you go off and you have a baby right away, you're kind Mm of, you know, the things that you don't know are that, because I didn't, I would never have even thought that your gut flora is is disturbed and unbalanced because of the pill itself. And then also you have depleted B vitamins, which are essential for baby making. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is encouraging women to come off the pill like a minimum of a year before you plan to start a family, preferably two. Um, You know, unfortunately, doctors are so frequently telling people, oh, you know, three months should be sufficient. And some people, you know, they come off the pill and they start trying right away. And, And I think that that's really problematic. I mean, first of all, there really has been very little research on the impact of residual artificial hormones in a woman's, you know, body on a developing fetus. So that's one major issue. Um, Another is that if you're not healthy, you're more likely to have recurrent miscarriage and miscarriages are very hard on the body as well. And... Um, you know, what I'm seeing in my practice is that, you know, if women adopt the kinds of things that I've been talking about in terms of nutrition and whatnot, on average, I would say it takes about nine months for a woman to get back to healthy reproductive functioning where she's clearly ovulating every month. She's got a healthy, what's called luteal phase of time from ovulation to menstruation. Um, and she's got, you know, healthy cervical mucus when she's supposed to have it. And she's not getting, you know, unhealthy types of mucus when she's not supposed to have it and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it's really important that women give themselves time for that. And I, I have frequently worked with women, you know, in the fertility side of my practice, Um, who have come to me saying that they're currently trying to conceive. And once I see their charts, you know, I've really strongly encouraged them to stop trying for a few months so that we can work on getting their health um, up to par. Because as I said, if you you are unhealthy and having those kind of recurrent mini miscarriages where it's like it might even be happening before – 
you're aware that you're pregnant. Like sometimes women um, have a conception, but they end up miscarrying um, because there isn't even a long enough time in her cycle for implantation to occur. So she might get her period right when she's expecting it and think she didn't get pregnant. Well, she might have actually conceived. And so as I said, that can be hard on the body. And so it's really important to kind of take that break, that time out, and really devote yourself to, you know, cleaning up your own health and getting your nutrient stores back up so that you can support that pregnancy. It's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I noticed that, you know, one of the programs that you offer through the Red Ten Sisters is your Conceive with Grace program. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many women in my life and just in general who are trying Mm -hmm. to conceive and having a really hard time you know, whether that process is just taking way longer than they ever thought it would, or whether they're having to go and, you know, get medical interventions. Uh, Mm -hmm. One of the things that I struggle with as as a friend is what are some ways that you can support a woman who is going through that? And, you know, Mm -hmm. what do you say? How do you help? And, and for the women who are going through it, I mean, how do you kind of stay positive? How do you kind of, you know, don't not not Mm -hmm. lose hope and those types of things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, the Conceive with Grace program really did come out of, um, you know, this need to address women who had been trying for a while and and kind of came to me later along and and were really struggling with the impacts um, that their experiences so far were having on their mental outlook. You know, as we've talked about, the, the stress has a huge impact on our fertility And there's nothing more stressful than feeling like your body's broken or that um, you're failing as a woman, which I think is what a lot of women experience. And so that program is really designed to, you know, coach women through their experiences um, to help them to connect with their own inner knowing, um, to connect with that part of them that, um, that feels whole. And we can really lose sight of that when we're experiencing infertility. And so that program does include a lot of the other more practical aspects like the diet and the nutrition that we were talking about. But the focus really is more on kind of a a spiritual aspect, which is how do we let go of the um, the pain and the shame that comes from not being able to get pregnant? Um, How do we connect to, on a deeper level, to kind of the spirit of the child that we're trying to draw into our life or who we already in many cases might sense is there and we're trying to figure out what's the disconnect why why is this not happening (laughs) right yeah yeah no I think that that's really important because I just I there's few things in life that would be as stressful especially because there's so many things in our life that we try to control and Mm -hmm. You know, you go to school, you you get a job, you just, there's a lot of really successful women out there that worked Mm -hmm. really, really hard to get where they're at. And, you know, everything finally comes into place. You have Mm -hmm. whatever it is, you have the relationship, you have the job. I was even talking to a friend yesterday and um, she conceived uh, with her partner at a young age. And and then she kind of took a break from having babies while she was getting her career together and, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. And she was saying that her and her husband are not able to conceive now. That's what she was saying. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, she's like, I have everything now. She's like, I have the job, I have the money. And, you know, it's all this, this picture should look like this, but there's this Mm -hmm. this part missing. And yeah, well, it's hard for me because, um, you know, I kind of walk that line between, um, you know, I, I am, I was trained in the practical aspects of fertility and I I do come from a health sciences background. So I have a practical explanation for it. And then I also have this very spiritual part of myself that has a slightly different uh, take on the whole thing. So from a practical perspective, um, I think we are, we're, we're facing a really big challenge kind of from a logistical feminist, um, situation in that our, our bodies are, and our biological selves are not aligning with kind of our, our feminist and our, you know, current culture. Um, it, it shocks a lot of people to learn that, you know, our, our best baby making years are 23 to 29. Um, but you know, we're really taught in our society that you gotta, as you said, you gotta get the degree, you gotta get the good job, you gotta find the perfect partner, you gotta buy the house, you gotta get all, all your ducks in a row 
then you can start trying to have babies. And, you know, for most people, that takes well into your 30s before all those things are lined up. And then people are finally ready. And then it's like, oh, well, maybe your body is is now all, like, I don't want to say approaching perimenopause, but, I mean, perimenopause is a 10-year process. And, like, any time after 30, like, five, your body really is in a declining fertility state. So, you know, that kind of sounds like this super ominous, <laughs> like, um situation and I hate talking about that with women but that's sort of the biological reality of things is that our bodies are not really lining up with what our culture is supposed to be telling us and I think a lot of women feel really angry about that when they start trying to get pregnant and rightfully so I mean we're told that it's very shameful to get pregnant when you're young you know that you have to that to be a good girl you have to do all these things you graduate you do xyz and it's kind of like women are doing all these things and then they might get to a point in their life where becoming a mother feels like the most important thing they've never wanted anything more and they can't get it and and I can understand why that makes a lot of people really not only frustrated but angry um and to feel a lot of despair <laughs> because it feels like you've just been like, you know, on the grind this whole time, just accomplishing, accomplishing, accomplishing. And then you want some real meaning and, sus you know, like reason for being and love and, you know, all the beauty that comes with having a family. And then you feel like you're denied it after all this hard work. It's, it's really frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's kind of one piece of it. And then I think on the other side of it, um, infertility or struggling to conceive in your 30s is partly about teaching women that there are limits to that paradigm, that paradigm of the, the constant working, the constant striving, the constant trying to be on top because um, getting pregnant is really one of those things that happens best when you're not trying really hard, you know, yeah. like when you're, if you're trying too hard, then that's a form of stress. And, um, and so it's to me almost like a, a life lesson that is coming through from our experience of trying to get pregnant um, that's teaching us about how to just be. How do we be in the moment? How do we stop striving? How do we stop, you know, trying <laughs> so hard all the time and, and learn to just be in the moment, appreciate our partners, experience love and intimacy and connection and have those be really sacred things and kind of call in the divine into our life. And um yeah, so those are two totally different yeah. <laughs> explanations of what's happening, but that's kind of how I see it. Well, I couldn't agree more, and uh, because I find myself at this period of my life, kind of like the pinnacle of it. You know, you get the job, you get the career, you get yeah. the man, you have a baby, but yeah. then you have this job that requires, in my case, 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. um, and having a baby changes you, and it, it nice. kind of puts your entire life and existence into, into question, like into very mm -hmm. severe question, and what you said about feminism and how it's kind of, I feel like everything is backwards. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, when you're most fertile, when you could get pregnant mm -hmm. with, you know, just yeah. in your sleep without even yeah. <laughs> knowing anything about anything, we're told yeah. not to. Yeah. And then during that whole period, the birth control pill is, well, sterilizing you. Yeah. And then when you're outside of the most yeah that when you're outside of the best time that you could mm -hmm. get pregnant then that's when you're supposed to start yeah. so I find myself actually questioning feminine like not in in general but questioning like what does it all mean because mm -hmm. it's not really there's certain aspects of that paradigm that are not serving me at all yeah. like I have to create my own paradigm mm -hmm. and how do you how do you create change in the world where really and truly in, in, with respect to having children if women had the support they needed at the younger age then mm -hmm. this wouldn't really be an issue but the issue yeah. is that you have to set yourself up financially um mm -hmm. yeah or at least have support um yeah. so that you can actually because it's and then you know i also jokingly find myself you know looking at women who did have their babies in their early 20s now mm -hmm. and in their 30s and yeah. 40s they have all this quote unquote freedom because yeah. and yeah. then they can focus on whatever they want right yeah yeah and they're younger so they can enjoy being a grandparent more and they you know there, there are other advantages too to having had your kids younger I think you have more energy and you're going to be around to see more of their life and more of your grandkids lives so yeah, yeah. and it's not, I, I don't think the message is that there's one right way but no. I think the message is that maybe there's no wrong way 
And I think maybe mm-hmm. that's what needs to come out because um, yeah. having your children young, there's a lot of really great things about that. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one being that you were able to. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because if you if you finally have all your ducks in a row when you're like 42, that makes it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make it impossible. It just means that it comes with some very real challenges. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it definitely um, feeds back into a whole other, you know, what I see as sort of another patriarchal system, which is then you're in a position where you kind of have to rely on, you know, fertility clinics and everything becoming totally medicalized and, you know, IUI and IVF. And, you know, I don't, um, you know, I'm not saying that I, I wish those things didn't exist, but it is, it's a totally different approach to have a baby that, and it's, and it really takes the power again away from the woman. So it's kind of interesting to me. It's like, oh, we have to give our power away to this pill to keep us from getting pregnant for 10 or 20 years. And then we have to give our power away over to a clinic to help us get pregnant when we're, you know, when everything is said and done. So when all along, if you had just accidentally got pregnant at 21, this yeah. wouldn't be an issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But then if you had accidentally yeah. got pregnant at 21 or 17, then you would have been this, all of the Oh, I know. The negative. shame is so intense. And, you know, women are not, as you said, they're not well supported at that age. And it's very hard, you know, to be a good parent if you don't have the resources and the support that you need to, to be a good parent. Um, and, you know, because it is the most challenging job on earth, really, <laughs> you know. So... It kind of does feel like, uh, excuse my language, that you're kind of screwed either way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how it seems. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I think that I just hope that in like my generation that mm-hmm. is sometimes I think the answer is, you know, creating your own reality. So instead of relying on a job and going through that whole system of how everything needs to be structured, Mm-hmm. trying to create your own way yeah. because yeah. the way that's, that's there probably, isn't serving. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's probably why we're seeing such a surge of like female entrepreneurs. I think a lot of women are trying to figure out ways to design careers that really are supportive of their, their motherhood. Um, you know, that they can work around their children's schedules, that they can, um, you know, still have an outlet for that other piece of them. That's something, you know, creative and, you know, wants to be part of the workforce for all of the benefits that come with that, but that who don't want to have to sacrifice their motherhood um, for it either. I guess another piece of this, of course, is, you know, you don't want to go through all that work to finally have your baby and then have to hand them over to childcare and uh, not see them for nine hours a day. Right. So it's, um, but really what choice do we have? Right. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult situation. There's no question. Um, and, but yeah, I really think it's, it's forcing us to have to get creative with creating new paradigms, as you said. And I, I hope that, I hope we'll figure that out. I think we are figuring it out. I just, I don't know how it's going to look yeah. <laughs> eventually, but I think, I think we're figuring it out. Yeah, no, I think you're spot on there. Cause I feel like these conversations, I never had them when I was growing up, mm-hmm. but given the experience that I'm having, um, as a mother and as a woman in the world, trying to organize my life around working and, you know, mm-hmm. these are conversations that I would be having with my children. And so the future, you know, looks brighter for them in the sense that at least we having gone through these types of experiences can impart some of our quote unquote wisdom mm-hmm. <laughs> on them. Yeah. Um, and so maybe to switch gears a little bit, one of the things that I would like to see in the world someday, as we talked about, is this being part of the education system or even just having fertility awareness education be available to young women. Um, mm-hmm. I've said in some of the previous shows that I've done that, you know, I think it's the perfect time. Often young girls aren't trying to get pregnant, so you don't have that mm-hmm. stress. And yeah. <laughs> not every young teenage girl is having sex either. Um, mm-hmm. So you don't, nec- you don't necessarily have the stress of having to figure it out for the purpose of contraception. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And even if you've done any work in those areas. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. This is something that my sister and I have been super passionate about from day one. Um, we've just really struggled about how to make it happen. We have um, touched base with some of the school boards, but of course, this type of thing is so like highly monitored in the curriculum. And um, unfortunately, it's really just the public health nurses that are on staff, at least with the Toronto District School Board. I don't know how it is with the other school boards across the country, but there's really limits on who can kind of come in and start educating around sexuality. So that's a huge limitation. Um, but, you know, we're hoping that that might change over time or that um, some of those public health nurses might actually be educated about fertility awareness themselves and they would be, you know, in a position to be able to do that education. Um, so on a more informal basis, we've had the joy of being um invited a couple of times now to speak with a group at uh, Riverdale Collegiate in Toronto, um, where basically there's an art teacher there who started a women or a girls group, women and girls, <laughs> um, an after school group. And they do all sorts of different things. Um, and because it's outside of school hours and it's kind of voluntary, um, there's a lot less restrictions around what can happen. And uh, and she's also been willing to kind of put her neck on, a, on the line a little bit because she feels really passionately about the kinds of information that she wants these girls to have access to. So we've gone there and given talks about this topic. Um, we've even talked about sexuality and sex toys and contraception and all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, in my dream world, we would be invited, you know, <laughs> to schools all over the city to do that kind of thing on a regular basis. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm hopeful, again, that there's something will emerge as a way to make sure that every, every young woman growing up gets access to this information. Yeah, I, I completely, I couldn't agree more. And I actually found myself the other night reminiscing about the Sunday night sex show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was actually, I was, I was kind of laughing, like, you know, just thinking about how I used to, because I kind of, I never had access to the internet when I was growing up and I didn't have, you know, my sexual education in school was super limited. But um, I remember sitting, you know, in my room, listening to the radio, having to tune in at like nine o'clock on a Sunday night, and I'd have to close the door and listen to it really quietly (laughs) in my room. And I just think, you know, now we have all of these tools. So even if you don't make it into the school system, I mean, what I'm loving about podcasting is that I can sit in my basement and try to make a difference in the world. (laughs) Um, So, uh, you know, maybe we don't need the school system in order to reach all these teens. Maybe we just have to keep putting it out there until they find us. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And with YouTube and stuff, we have a YouTube channel as well so there's you know certainly you know new ways of of reaching the audience um at a younger age so yeah we just um I just want to make sure that they're getting the information before they're running into problems like so often we google things once we have a problem right and I want to make sure that they're getting this information you know before they run into you know side effects with the pill or troubles finding an effective contraception or you know whatever it is um yeah, but I'm sure we'll figure that out. <laughs> yeah, as time as time goes yeah, on. <laughs> that's right. So maybe if you wanted to, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask, ask you actually was kind of related to the fertility awareness method and kind of going into natural hormonal birth controls method. So maybe maybe you could t- touch on the, the benefits of actually relying on a holistic natural method of birth control when compared to the typical mainstream hormonal birth control options? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd love to. So I think I've mentioned already that for me, one of the biggest things, of course, is just increased body literacy. So understanding how your body works, um, tracking things on a regular basis so that whenever anything shows up, um, it's a clue to us that there's something that needs attention. You know, So whether it's something simple like a food allergy or whether it's something more serious, one of my colleagues... Um, she does the cervical self-examinations as part of her fertility awareness method, and she found a little bump on her cervix, so she went and had it checked out. And, you know, if she weren't doing this method, she would never have have known that that was an issue. And, you know, sometimes we only get PAPs every two years. It depends what age you're, you're at and what risk, you know. But so something like that left untreated could be an issue. Um, so there's so many health benefits to being in tune with your body. Um, one of the things I really love about this method is how much it encourages couples to communicate. And uh, my sister Kim is actually 
uh, just finishing up a research methods course. And so she had to do a survey and kind of analyze the results, kind of like a pilot study. So we put out a questionnaire um, for people who use fertility awareness methods last month. And we got quite a good response. She only needed 20 people in order to run this pilot, but we got over 80. And um, one of the things that people mentioned, which, you know, she and I talk about quite a bit in in kind of our education of, of the public, but that we weren't expecting to come through so strongly. It was just how many people said that it had really improved their sex life um, through doing this method, just because, um, you know, partly it encourages communication with your partner. But the other major thing is that, you know, with there being kind of required abstinence during, during certain times of the cycle, it really encourages alternative sex practices. And we really like to talk about the importance of exploring that because, you know, research shows that over 70% of women can't orgasm from vaginal intercourse alone. And so if your idea of sex is only about like missionary position, whatever, then there's a lot of women who are not really experiencing a lot of pleasure with their sexual activity. And so when you take the emphasis off of vaginal intercourse being kind of like the main course, and you take the things that are usually considered the appetizers and you turn them into the main course, so whether it's you know manual stimulation or oral stimulation, a lot of women discover, oh wow, I actually like this better, <laughs> you know, or I'm experiencing more pleasure from doing these other things. And uh, so couples tend to get a lot more creative with their sexual practices, I find, uh, using this method, which I think is really a wonderful um, and somewhat unexpected for most people's side effect <laughs> of using this method. Um, and, and what's interesting is that, you know, hormonal birth control, even though it's super effective, a lot of research suggests that it actually decreases women's libido. So then it's kind of like counterproductive if it's making you not actually want to have sex. And the whole point is to <laughs> make you be able to have sex without getting pregnant. So I always find that kind of ironic as well. Um, so that's, and there's so many, you know, similar side effects, um, with hormonal birth control that, you know, can be really, some of them just annoying and some of them very serious. Um, so yeah, I, does that answer your question? Oh, it totally does. Yeah. And I, I love how you expanded it to that, the point about how it can improve your sex life and improve communication mm-hmm. with your partner. I think that mm-hmm. it's such a great point because um, I think people think it would be limiting. Um, mm-hmm. And it turns out that as long as you take it from a sex positive approach, it can actually be very freeing yeah. and very enjoyable yeah. and very pleasurable. And you don't mm-hmm. feel like you're missing out on anything because it can be way mm-hmm. better, as you mentioned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. One of the questions that I did want to ask you kind of going on that point though was so for someone who is thinking about the fertility awareness method but they don't actually like the concept of abstaining I mean we did talk about Mm -hmm. alternative sex and so at least now it's you know you know you have lots of fantastic options but for those who kind of they do want to have sex during that time what are some of the options that they can use for birth control? Yeah absolutely so um I support all my clients to use other methods of birth control. Um, And so many of my clients use condoms during the fertile days. Um, And what I typically tend to recommend is if somebody really, really wants like high levels of efficacy, I generally encourage two other methods during the fertile days. So that might be, for example, condoms plus withdrawal or a condom plus... um, like a diaphragm or something so that you're kind of doubling up. Um, And the main reason being that a lot of um, barrier methods, for example, will fail um, during the fertile time because everything's so slippery. So when we have that fertile cervical mucus, then a diaphragm is more likely to slip out of place, a condom is more likely to slip off. And the other thing that people have to keep in mind is that when they do research on the efficacy of things like condoms, um, there are people in that study who aren't even having sex during the fertile days. <laughs> so the efficacy is slightly skewed there. And you also have to remember that if a method is going to fail, it can only fail when we're actually in our fertile time. Like, you know, if a condom fails in the first half of our cycle or before we're anywhere near cervical mucus for that's fertile, then that person is not going to get pregnant. And But it won't be because of the condom. Yeah. It'll be because they weren't fertile. So if a condom breaks, you know, people of healthy fertility have like a 75% chance of getting pregnant if they have unprotected sex during a fertile day. 
um, you know, and that's if you're like in the prime of your fertility and you're both really healthy, which most people aren't these days, but still we should go with that stat. So 75%. So if a condom breaks during that time, you're kind of in a high risk. So that's why I like to encourage kind of doubling up on two different methods, um, during that phase of the cycle. So that's usually what I recommend. And there are some new products on the market, like the fem cap, which is basically a cervical cap that you don't have to get fitted by a doctor. You can actually order it on the internet. So there are some new products coming that are making it easier to get access to them because for a long time you could only get diaphragms fitted by a doctor um so that in itself could be a barrier but then because diaphragms became so unpopular there are many many doctors who don't even know how to fit a diaphragm anymore Mm -hmm. so access has become an even bigger issue Um, but now with some new products on the market women um have access to those barrier methods and and really we have to remember that the um cervical caps and diaphragms are really just meant to be holders for spermicide And so we also need to keep in mind um, the health of the spermicide because some spermicides can be irritants or they can also disrupt the balance of bacteria in the vagina. We don't want to get yeast infections and stuff. Um, So we carry a product called Contragel, which is one that is pretty body safe. It's about as body safe as you can get with regards to spermicide. I mean, you have to remember that if it's killing sperm, it's... You're probably... Your body probably doesn't love it (laughs) because it's got things in there that are kind of... um, you know, toxic or, or not very friendly to to bodily fluids, but um, but still, it's important to remember that that those methods, like cervical caps and diaphragms, are really meant as as holders for spermicides. Well, I think that's yeah, I think mm-hmm. that's really valuable information, and I also I couldn't it crossed my mind. You know, there's there's still I would imagine there's still lots of people who still use the birth control pill along with condoms um, as a way of mm-hmm. doubling up, and so I think yep. it's important to know that. Uh, with the fertility awareness method, you have, you know, this whole other option. Um, yeah. And then the doubling up part of it goes w- in the mm-hmm. fact that you don't, you you actually physically can't get pregnant at certain mm-hmm. times. So it's, you can choose to exactly. use a condom on those days as well. And that's mm-hmm. doubling up on your birth control yeah. in a sense. So I just have a couple questions, I guess, to wrap up the show. These are some questions I've kind of been asking at the end here and there. Mm-hmm. And yep. so in general, what would you say are still some of the most common or even just one or two um, common myths or misunderstandings about the fertility awareness method in general? Oh, well, definitely the one that it's the same as the rhythm method. I just read an article in like something big yesterday. It wasn't Huffington Post, but it was like something like that that was basically like talking about how the rhythm method is back. And I'm like, okay, fertility awareness is not the rhythm method. And they go on to like kind of group rhythm method with fertility awareness. And like, these are totally different approaches. <laughs> so that kind of drives me crazy. I think that, you know, with all the apps on the market these days, the, the line between rhythm method and fertility awareness is getting a little more blurry. Um, so that's definitely, um, a huge challenge. And another is just that doctors are so, um, kind of poorly educated in their, in their own, um, training about fertility awareness and about how women's reproduction works. And so they don't understand it. They don't believe it, most of them. And so they're not supportive of their patients wanting to try this method. And I think that's hugely problematic. I get a lot of women who feel really anxious about coming off the pill um, because their doctors have basically told them that they, they're like, oh, well, fine, if you want to get pregnant. Like so saying really derogatory things and just kind of assuming that these women, you know, are going to get pregnant or that they don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, and doctors are in a very in a real position of power and so that can be very belittling and disempowering for for patients um so i think those are two two major barriers around fertility awareness methods that really still exist and that we're really having to to struggle with yeah i completely agree and i saw an example of that i'm not sure if you saw the there i i didn't see the whole episode but there was a clip that i saw online um, from the doctors because the Mm. creators of kendara were on the doctors Right. And there was a point in the clip where the the female doctor, I'm not sure exactly what her specialization, she may have been mm-hmm. a gynecologist, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. She basically <laughs> implied that it was amazing that Katie had never gotten pregnant, mm-hmm. you know, because she mm-hmm. basically implied that using fertility awareness was the same as not using anything. Yeah. And so yeah. it speaks to what you said about how the, the knowledge yeah. of, and awareness of doctors is so limited. And so for any of our listeners who are currently on the pill and maybe they're listening to this podcast because they're thinking about coming off and they're trying to kind of gather more information about fertility awareness. Um, mm-hmm. They don't want children right now, but they do want them someday. 
and they, you know, maybe within the next two to three years, what advice, Mm -hmm. if any, would you give to them? Well, one of the things that I like um, to tell women who are kind of in that contemplative um, stage of things is that um, you can actually start to chart while you're still on the pill. And, And I think that that's actually a great thing to do if you're sort of on the fence or feeling nervous, because it gives you an opportunity just to really hone the skills of the checking Um, the charting, like all of that, so that when, if and when you decide you are ready to come off the pill, um, then you have one less thing thing to worry about, right? So there are many stages to mastering fertility awareness. And one of them is really just getting in the habit, like getting in the habit of checking for mucus every day. And just like changing our diet or exercising, you know, it takes a while to change a habit. And, you know, for most of my clients, the first few times, first you know, a few weeks, maybe even of charting, they'll go to the washroom and sit down and then they'll be, Oh, I forgot to check, you know? So it takes a while just to develop those skills. And so it can be nice to kind of get those under your belt. Um, so that when you come off, it's, it's one less thing to worry about. And then you also, you know, you're not, you kind of get to taste what it's all about, um, before making a commitment to it. So that's something I would definitely recommend. I mean, obviously, you're not going to see a real cycle because women are not ovulating when they're on the pill. But as I said, there's so many skills that you can you know, develop and hone uh, before deciding whether or not to come off the pill. And I think that's a great way to kind of build confidence and understand how your body works um, before making that leap. Of- mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's yeah, those are great words of wisdom. And just to get into the habit, I think is a great way to transition. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that kind of brings us towards the end of today's show. But before we end, I would love it if for any of our listeners who are inspired and want to get in touch with you, want to work with you. Um, mm-hmm. I'm guessing that you have clients all over the world. I'm, glass- I'm guessing that you don't need to be in, in Toronto to actually work with you. <laughs> no, not at all. In fact, I'm actually living in the UK at the moment for a few months. And I do have clients all over the world, several here in the UK and in continental Europe and all over North America. And I have had people from South America and the Middle East and all sorts. So yeah, you don't have to be in Toronto to work with me. Um, I basically, the two main programs that I teach are a six month program and a nine month program. Both of them have a combination of uh, group and one on one services. And the group calls are all done by teleconference call. You can call from anywhere in the world um, and connect with other women who are in the program. So it's a great way of receiving support. Um, and kind of encouragement from women who are on a similar journey. And uh, the one-on-one sessions with me can be done in person if you are in Toronto, but um, because so many of my clients are elsewhere, we we use Skype and we use teleconference line, phone, sometimes Google Hangout, all that great modern technology that allows us to kind of connect from wherever we are. So um, yeah, I'm available to anyone who who wants to be connected. You can reach out to us on our website at redtensisters.com and you can and reach me at amy at red sisters.com and we're we on kind of pretty much all the social media channels so feel free to contact us that way as well okay and i'll make sure to, to have all the links to your youtube channel and i also noticed that you just started um a podcast yeah we've only done two <laughs> episodes so far but I've, I've recorded a few more that will be coming out so yeah. <laughs> well i was doing my research um and i said oh they have podcasts yeah. too that's amazing mm-hmm. so uh, so a link to that as well and uh, the website and everything. So you'll find all those all those ways to link to you in the show notes. So I'd just like to thank you, Amy, so much for being so generous with your time today. It was a pleasure recording with you. And I'm just so excited for our listeners to be able to learn from you. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me on. You asked really great questions, probably one of the best uh, interview <laughs> questions I've ever received. So I appreciate I appreciate all the education you're doing, actually. It's it's so important. And the more of us who are doing it and sharing our stories about how this has impacted our life, I think the better. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That's very <laughs> sweet of you to say. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, Amy. And I'll talk to you soon. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening today. If you did enjoy today's episode, as I mentioned before, please tweet me at Fertile Friday and stop by the blog and leave a comment to join the conversation. So you'll find today's podcast episode at fertilityfriday.com slash Amy. And uh, you can also find me on our Facebook fan page, which is facebook.com slash Fertility Fridays with an S. So thanks again for listening. And until next time, be well and happy charting.